They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called naval legends. From the first days of World War II, the Royal Navy desperately needed a carrier-borne fighter plane of the new generation. The British Navy didn't realize the importance of aviation for naval warfare. Conservatism reigned there. In fact, they didn't even see any potential aerial targets at sea. They didn't think aviation would be useful to them. Meanwhile, in other countries, for example, Japan or the US, it was developing at a tremendous pace. This situation resulted in a paradox where the leading naval power in Europe entered World War II with outdated carrier-based aircraft, the Swordfish Strike Plane and the Gloucester Gladiator Fighter. It wasn't until May 1940 that the British Navy received a modern carrier-borne fighter aircraft, the Ferry Fulmer. The Ferry Aviation Company produced 600 vehicles before the end of 1942. The Ferry Fulmer is the first stress-skin, all-metal monoplane fighter that the Navy had specifically built and ordered for it. The Fulmer as a name, as a, as a graceful bird, a beautiful sea bird that is extremely agile uh, and, and is, is, is a beautiful, um, almost an acrobatic flying gull. Specifications of the Fairy Fulmer carrier-borne fighter plane. Length, over 12 meters. Wingspan, over 14 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 4,944 kilograms. Engine, Rolls-Royce Merlin 30, 1,300 horsepower. Maximum speed, 426 kilometers per hour at a height of 3,000 meters. Armament, eight 7.7 millimeter Browning machine guns. Payload, eight 11 kilogram bombs under the wings. Crew, two people. There's the pilot, of course, at the front, and again, an observer stroke navigator in the rear compartment. This is essential, again, for navigating across open sea, where there are very, very few landmarks or referent marks to get the aircraft safely back to the, the aircraft carrier. The observer, situated in the rear cockpit, would have to be constantly taking plotting details to track their course away from the ship, and, of course, back to the ship safely to recover with the ship not being in the same position as when they left it. The aircraft was too big for a fighter plane and had insufficient speed. In addition, the crew faced considerable difficulties when their vehicle was shot down and they needed to leave it as quickly as possible. In this case, the high location of the tailplane posed serious danger. Firstly, they have to get the aircraft cockpit open, which slides back, but only that far. So now the pilot has to unbuckle himself, get himself out into the slipstream of, of, of the aircraft, which is possibly as much as 150 to 200 miles an hour. And then, whilst being buffeted by that wind and slipstream, has to get himself out onto the wing and jump through the gap between the main plane and the tail plane. Now, the critical thing there is the tail plane is not going to wait for him to go through the gap. The, the tail plane is still coming forwards at 200 miles an hour. It was even more difficult to leave the aircraft for the navigator. If the cabin was ablaze and the pilot had already bailed out or was wounded, the vehicle could enter an uncontrolled spin, and the navigator's odds for escape were slim to none. Fortunately, there are very few recorded problems other than getting out, because adrenaline works wonders. If you have to get out, you'll do things you normally cannot achieve. Regardless of all the Fulmer's shortcomings, it received an enthusiastic welcome in the Royal Navy. For nine months, World War II ravaged Europe, and the new fighter plane could not have come at a better time. It took part in uh, air cover support 
for uh, work in the Mediterranean and the defense of Malta, uh, as well as doing reconnaissance, fighter reconnaissance work for the Bismarck raid ahead of the swordfish and also for the Battle of Taranto, again in the Mediterranean. From March 1941, the British Royal Navy began to receive US carrier-borne aircraft under the Lend-Lease policy, a program under which the US supplied its allies with everything necessary to support their war efforts. At the same time, Great Britain continued to design and create their own aircraft. Because we have limited resources compared with America, we design airplanes that can do more than one task. They're designed for a specific task but they're adapted to do others. The Royal Air Force performed excellently during the Battle of Britain. Even the Hurricane, which was quite obsolete compared to the German Messerschmitt and inferior to it in terms of specifications. It was still a good and reliable fighter plane, which pretty much allowed them to defend Britain. And in wartime, under the conditions of limited funds and resources, they just took this Hurricane and rebuilt it to be used as a carrier-borne plane. However, when Allies got closer to the enemy shore, so to speak, that's when they needed a more reliable fighter. Again, they took a land-based aircraft, the Spitfire, and upgraded it to be used from carriers under a new name, the Seafire. Specifications of the Supermarine Seafire F Mark 17 carrier-borne fighter. Length, 10 meters. Wingspan, over 11 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 4,300 kilograms. Engine, Rolls-Royce Griffin 6, 1,850 horsepower. Maximum speed, 636 kilometers per hour at a height of 3,900 meters. Armament, two 20 millimeter Hispano Mark V cannons, four 7.7 millimeter Browning machine guns. Payload, one 227 kilogram bomb under the fuselage or two 114-kilogram bombs under wings and a suspended fuel tank under the fuselage. Unguided rockets, eight RP-3 rockets. Crew, one person. The Sea Fire was an extremely effective and, and useful aircraft once airborne, but during the takeoff and landing on a ship was incredibly difficult. Often difficult enough on a land-based airfield, the Spitfire undercarriage um, can be vulnerable enough on a rough landing on a land base, uh, but even more so on a ship with a heaving flight deck that may be raising up 20 or 30 feet during the swell of, 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 of a ship's flight deck rising. The Spitfire undercarriage uh, was proving to be quite a problem uh, with its narrow track and its quite small design and size and, and um, strength when it became um, used as a, as, as a a flight deck aircraft. However, the aircraft was constantly upgraded. Further models featured more powerful engines and contra-rotating propellers for the latest modification. By the end of the, of, of the Seafire development, it was an extremely useful airplane once it was flying. And airborne, it was every bit as effective as the, the RAF were finding the Spitfire to be during the Battle of Britain or any of their major air offensives. Superb handling aircraft, loved by the pilots once, once airborne. Simultaneously with the work on a new fighter, British engineers were designing an all-purpose carrier-borne aircraft. Their efforts resulted in the Fairy Firefly, which entered service in 1943. Specifications of the Fairy Firefly FR-1 carrier-borne fighter. Length over 11 meters, wingspan over 13 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 6,759 kilograms. Engine, Rolls-Royce Griffin 2B. 1,735 horsepower. Maximum speed, 509 kilometers per hour at a height of 5,200 meters. This one was done by people, manually fold. There was no power. It took 20 people to get the wings from their present folded position into the flight position so the aircraft could take off. That took time. 
It took time also, once the pilot had landed the airplane on the flight deck, to get the aircraft back into the folding position so it took up less space or could go in the hangar. Again, 20 people, very manpower intensive. A crew of two, but at least 20 people on the ground so you could actually operate. Armament. 420 Hispano Suiza Mark II cannons in wings. Payload, two 454 kilogram or 227 kilogram under wings. RP-3 unguided rockets. Crew, two people. And they also enjoyed the fact they had someone to talk to in the back. Single seat flying over the sea was not something pilots often enjoyed because they had to also track where they were, finding their ship, returning again, was often really quite difficult. When designing this fighter, British engineers considered all the faults of previous models that were causing crashes during takeoff. A plane needs a strong headwind to successfully take off from a ship deck. To achieve this, the carrier would turn towards the wind and accelerate to a maximum speed. With favorable wind conditions, two-thirds of the deck length was enough for the ferry firefly to take off. It would accelerate and take off without even reaching the ship's bow with about 60 meters of spare distance. If the ship could not generate sufficient wind, and they normally wanted something like 35 knots of wind over the deck, then in fact they had to use a catapult, which in those days was a hydraulic mechanical catapult, hydraulic ram, lots of wires and pulleys, and it went off. The faster takeoffs and landings happen, the better. Independent takeoffs allowed for a new launch every 10 seconds, while the use of a catapult slowed this process down to one minute. When landing his plane on a carrier, the pilot was assisted by a landing control officer who signaled instructions from the ship's deck with the help of paddles. When the Batman crossed his arms, the pilot merely closed his throttle, and if he got it right, his hook, which is the first part of the airplane to actually touch the deck, would catch one of the wires across the deck and he'd be brought to a halt from 100 miles an hour to zero in about 200 feet. He would then have to raise his hook and be taxied forward to actually keep out of the way of the aeroplane behind. They landed on with a worked up ship about one every 45 seconds. Several modifications of the Firefly were created. A deck fighter plane, a night interceptor equipped with a radar, which was cutting edge technology at that time, and a very good strike aircraft. A lot of pilots named their aircraft, usually with a girl's name. This one is no exception, Evil in Intentions. It's a play on words. If you say it quickly, Evil Intentions, which is exactly what the pilot hoped his aeroplane was actually achieving. We also, on the side of the aeroplane, have a map of Japan. One of these aeroplanes was the first British-built and designed aeroplanes to fly over Tokyo towards the end of World War II when the raids were starting on Tokyo itself before Japan surrendered. New aircraft successfully operated in the Pacific Ocean, providing support for Allied landing operations in North Africa, escorting bombers which attacked and sank German battleship Tirpitz in the Norwegian fjords. However, war is war, and losses were inevitable. Not only new vehicles had to be built, but also new crews had to be trained. It was better and safer to train pilots outside the country. And there was a great training pipeline in Canada, and in America, and in the West Indies, which people loved going to because the weather was lovely, and it was in wintertime normally when they went out. It was impossible to use real carriers for training, and future pilots exercised on special airfields that were the size of a flight deck. Ashore, he had 3,000 feet. On the ship, he had about 300 feet. Ashore, he had a 150-foot wide runway. On the ship, he had about a 50-foot runway. So everything was miniaturized, and he had to be a lot more accurate, a lot more skilled at getting himself back on again. So as well as lining himself up, he had to ignore what the ship was doing under him, otherwise he would actually never be get back onto the deck. The Sea Fury became one of the last propeller-driven planes used by the Royal Navy. It was a high-speed aircraft designed to defend carriers and their escort ships against air attacks. 
specifications of the Hawker Sea Fury FB Mark 11 carrier-borne fighter plane. Length over 10.5 meters, maximum takeoff weight 6,522 kilograms, wingspan almost 12 meters, maximum speed 724 kilometers per hour at a height of 6,100 meters, engine Bristol Centaurus 18, 2,560 horsepower. The shape of the wing they needed, you couldn't get people to fold it, so they gave the pilot a hydraulic little device. He'd press a button in the cockpit. Armament. Four 20mm Hispano Mark V cannons. Unguided rockets, up to 12 RP-3 rockets. Payload, up to 907 kilograms. Crew, one person. Usually, the Sea Furies were launched with the help of a hydraulic catapult because carrier's flight decks were too short for it to gain the necessary speed and take off with a full payload. If there was a catapult malfunction, additional rocket thrusters had to be used. These were mounted under the wings and activated by electrical ignition. Sadly, often that didn't happen, they went over the side. And there are two known cases of airplane going over the front when the Raytog kit didn't work at all, and the pilot sitting in the cockpit watching the airplane go over, sorry, the ship go overhead before he decided to get out and get himself rescued by the attendant destroyer. However, the service run of the Sea Fury was quite short. Engineers were already working on modern jet engines. New technologies allowed them to improve airplane dynamics, the system for flight control, and make vehicles more powerful and maneuverable. A new age of deck aviation began.